Good afternoon. My name is Mandy Kanukin, and I'm the Academic Program Director for the Alumni Association. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to the final On the Sidelines lecture of this year. This series is designed to foster the spirit of lifelong learning for our alumni and friends. And I hope with this year's interesting and engaging lineup of speakers, we've accomplished that goal for you this year. Today, I'd like to welcome you to Professor, or to, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Jim Schmiedler. Dr. Schmiedler conducts research in robotics and human biomechanics in the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. During today's lecture, Walk This Way, Legged Robots and Human Rehabilitation, you're going to learn about Professor Schmiedler's remarkable work with robots that is helping to rehabilitate patients that have experienced stroke or spinal cord injury. Dr. Schmiedler is a recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and engineers, and engineers and a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. His research is supported by the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Schmiedler is using his brilliant mind to make an impact on those who need it most, and Notre Dame is a better place with his research here. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Schmiedler. Thanks very much, Manny, for the kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming out on what looked like a really beautiful day that seems to be turning a bit. Um, it's great to be here to talk to you about walking. And um, let's see if we can, which all of you are, are quite familiar with. Uh, I happen to be an alum myself. Uh, I, I was a townie before I was an alum. I grew up here in South Bend with no connection to the university. Graduated back in 96, and uh, I've been back uh, on the faculty for about eight years, and it's, it's great. It's, it's great to be a Notre Dame alum. It's great to work here as well. So, um, We conduct legged robot research in my lab and human biomechanics research, and we, we're going to talk today a little bit about the intersection of ideas that flow into both of those. I'm on. Yeah, it's on. Um, and if you think about robotics research, uh, you might think about Curiosity, which I think of as being probably the most successful research robot uh, in the world today. And we, I say world because we're considering Mars part of the world. Um, it's a six-wheel vehicle. This is a selfie it took of itself um, on Mars. Uh, it was built out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA. It's been on Mars for four years now. Uh, very impressive. Perhaps only more impressive would be uh, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that were before it. One that lasted about seven years, the other lasted ten years. Absolutely tremendously successful. If you think about the most successful commercial robot that you can buy, um, you might think about the Roomba. So this is built by a company out of Massachusetts called iRobot. Two years ago they crossed the 10 million sold unit. Uh, and that was two years ago. So there's a lot of these. Maybe some of you have one at home, perhaps, even. They, they do a much better job now than they did when they first came out of the market of actually keeping your house clean. Uh, it's a robot vacuum cleaner. And so if the most successful research robot in the world is a wheeled robot on Mars, and the most successful commercial robot in the world is a wheeled robot in your house, potentially, you might ask yourself why I'm wasting my time with things like this. <laughs> Right? That's a very reasonable argument. Um, these are two of the legged robots in my locomotion biomechanics lab. It's over in Cushing Hall, just a stone's throw from here. Um, and yes, I essentially devoted my career to legs instead of wheels. And uh, I will argue to you that, that legs are good, not in every circumstance, but, but legs certainly have advantages. And before the clouds came, if you were thinking about getting over to St. Mary's Lake today, you would have seen a great example of where legs are really advantageous. If you are on unprepared terrain, like these kids are here, uh, feeding the ducks at the lake, legs are really good. Because you only need discrete footholds to, to maintain your balance. Uh, a bike is not going to be effective on, on a rock field like this. If someone has gone to the trouble of smoothing the terrain for you already, yes, wheels are a tremendous advantage. The skateboard will, will beat you down the quad. Um, but your, your dog will beat an ATV through the woods every day of the week and twice on Sundays because the, the discrete footholds that the legs uh, allow you to use instead of a continuous path that wheels would require are really advantageous. 
We also want robots to work in an environment designed for human beings. Uh, and so environments that are designed for human beings who have legs themselves, many of you probably walk stairs today. And if you're going to have robot collaborators with humans, they're going to be operating in environments like this where, where wheels are not particularly successful. And so that's the motivation we have for, for legged robots. Uneven terrain outdoors, and then human designed environments with uneven terrain designed for humans. If we have those advantages, you might ask yourself why we don't see more robots like this. Right? This is uh, sort of a group of robot workers from the movie iRobot that had Will Smith in it several years ago. It's a great fun movie. Uh, it talks about the laws of robotics and it's in, inspired by the history of robotics as well. Uh, but robots we have, they don't look like this. And they're not deployed in large numbers like you saw in, in the science fiction movie. The state-of-the-art robots look more like this. This is called the Atlas Robot. It's built by a company called Boston Dynamics, uh, also out of Massachusetts funded largely by the Department of Defense. Um, it's a bit of a behemoth, right? It, it's a hydraulically actuated robot, which is to say it's got smaller than large earth-moving uh, equipment hydraulic cylinders, but it's the same technology that's used in, in tractors and in large dump trucks is to, to provide the large forces. Um, and so there's quite a difference between these very agile, human-like looking idealiz idealizations of robots and then the modern reality that we have. Science fiction does get some of these things right, though. Uh, this is the Iron Man exoskeleton. And exoskeletons are certainly a, an increasing area of research in, in robotics. The thing I like about this particular movie is, is they get the killer problem for legged robots correct. So this is, this is Robert Downey Jr. And this is his nuclear battery for a heart. So if you've seen the movie, he has a, uh, well, there's, I won't call it an accident, there's a battle that takes place, and he's injured, and he comes up with this uh, nuclear battery, which is, of course, science fiction, but it's a very lightweight and power, highly dense power source. And the reason I like this is, for reason we see it here in the exosuit, the, the killer problem for legged robots is energy. It also happens to be the killer problem for your automobiles, too, so it, it's common across wheels and legs. Uh, there's a reason we use gasoline-powered engines because the power density of that fuel is so high. And there's a reason we don't put typically gasoline engines on our robots is because they're going to operate in this room like the small electrical robots we have up here. We can't deal with the carbon monoxide fumes. Consider it power consumption, call it efficiency of movement, what have you. This is the killer problem for legged robots. It's the killer problem for mobile robots of any kind. It's the killer problem for the Mars rover. The, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that are no longer working are no longer working because their solar panels got covered with dust and didn't collect enough power. Power, if you're going to be mobile, you have to carry your power source with you. Now the nice thing is all of you brought your power sources with you to walk in here today. And humans are really, really good at this. Very, very efficient, consume very little power in the walking that you do. It's, it's kind of amazing. And so we'll talk a little bit about the, the tricks that you guys all use to get here without consuming a ton of power. And it, it really comes down to the idea of, of a pendulum clock. And so if you've got a, a traditional pendulum clock, right, most of the, the weight of the pendulum is here. You can assume that the, the rod that carries it is, has, is weightless. And in this position, it's, it's maybe at its max height, so it's not moving at all. It's getting ready to go back in the other direction to its minimum height where it has its largest velocity. It's moving with its fastest speed here. And so this is the point where this pendulum has the most kinetic energy. It's moving the fastest. And then it uses that energy to push itself back up to a new height, right, where it again comes to rest, has zero velocity, has no kinetic energy, but has what we would call the maximum potential energy. So it's at its highest height here. It's ready to fall back down and have its maximum velocity. If you flip this thing upside down, it's what we call an inverted pendulum, right? But now the opposite is true. When you are at the highest point, this thing actually has its smallest velocity. If you imagine it traveling over, it would reach its minimum velocity here, and then it would start falling. And, and its velocity would just increase and increase uh, uh, accordingly. You did exactly the same thing to get here. If we consider most of your body weight to be centered at your hip, and you look at 
my hips as I walk across the front of the room, or you think about your hips as you walk, they go up and down, almost in a sinusoidal pattern. And very much like the pendulum here, you have the slowest velocity when your center of mass is when your hips are at the highest point. So in, a, in walking a step, I slow down my velocity and increase my potential energy, the height of my hips, and then I basically fall over and convert all of that energy into forward kinetic energy. And so when my heel touches down, I right before my heel touches down, I have my maximum forward velocity. And so all you're doing in walking is exchanging potential and kinetic energy. Your center of mass, your hips go up and down just like the inverted pendulum. And that's how you save energy. That's, how, that's a trick that you use to be very, very efficient. Another way of thinking about it is you walk like an A rolling end over end. Right? The A goes up, center of mass is higher, it goes down, forward velocity increases, it uses that forward velocity to, to, to pick up again. One of the challenges is then that robots, like the one in this video and the little ones that if, if you can't see, feel free to come on up. They're, I think, going to start walking. Take a look at the robots and see uh, where you think their center of mass is going. They don't walk like you and I do. Right? Very, very flat-footed gates. Very, very bent knees. And as a result, they walk in a very robotic-like way where their hips don't go up and down. Instead, their hips basically maintain a complete straight line. And as a result, they're not exchanging the same energy that you're exchanging when they walk. And if we ask these things to walk for more than five minutes, they have very small batteries, they would just run out of juice. And the same to a large extent is true of these larger robots. <laughs> like we see in the video here, you get a nice side shot. Notice the bent knees. They're trying to make it look like it's walking heel to toe, but it's very, very flat footed. The hips are on a straight line. The battery is the backpack. It's a very mechanical way of walking. And so as a result, right, typical legged robots are very, very power hungry. They don't last very long before they have to be charged up again. And, and hence the, the killer problem here. Uh, if we go forward a little bit more. You'll see the trick they use for, for not falling. So if you stand with your body over one of your feet, you're less likely to fall. Watch how much the hips sway back and forth to get the weight on top of each foot. It's not a particularly dynamic way of walking. This is not how you walk down the stairs when, when you come in. You don't plant your foot, shift your next one, shift your weight on top of the next one before you pick this one up. It's just not a very energy efficient way of walking. So what we try to do in my lab is design robots that overcome this problem, that walk more like human beings. And so this is the Ernie robot that we built. It looks admittedly nothing like a human being, but I would hope that if you looked at this walking, you would say, yeah, that's more like the way Jim's walking now than the robots we just saw. It has no feet, right? It has racquetballs literally on the stubs of its, of its legs. Uh, these are some similar robots at other universities that use a similar strategy. Um, this is in Michigan, it's, it's called Mabel. Uh, there's another one in France called, called Rabbit. And, and again, these robots, they don't have arms, they don't have faces, they don't look like um, human beings. But the dynamics of how they walk is far more human-like than the robots that, that we saw, that we have up here, that, that do look more. And the difference is, we try to use this inverted pendulum dynamics in the walking of our robots. Specifically, we have a strategy where we actually measure how far forward the robot has fallen. So you can see my, one of my PhD students here is pushing the robot back and forth, and the legs are 
responding based on how far forward the body has fallen. So if you think about it, we're measuring this angle from the ground to the pendulum. And then we're controlling all of the motors inside the robot to be a function of that angle. So that you'll see here after, after a few trials, it'll actually put down the next foot. The foot will sense that it's, it's in support and it'll change which leg is, is the swing leg. And so the motion now is not a function of time. It's only a function of how far forward the robot has fallen. There, we just had a leg switch. And so now this leg will rotate back and forth. And we, are, we have another leg switch. So we're using the same mechanics that humans do to try to save energy in the way our robot walks. This is the same motion executed as a function of time, as if the robot were just simply walking with a clock. And I, I hope you can see that that's, that's less effective because if, if something unexpected happens, if you come up and trip it, et cetera, it's like a wind-up toy, which are fun, right? They're, they're great for walking, um, but they're not very good for the, the next problem uh, of, of robots that we'll talk about in, in a moment. So we're very interested in energy, right? And minimizing the amount of energy the robot consumes. One way to do that is to, to not have feet that are racquetballs on the ends of stubs, but to have curved feet. And so we did experiments where we looked at a small radius foot and a large radius foot. And we can also shift where the location of the foot is relative to the, the lower leg. So in both of these cases, the foot is shifted well forward. And you can see on the right hand side, right, with a large radius foot, you get a lot of knee bending. Uh, we'll see that again. So here, we have a small radius foot, no offset, and here where the foot is shifted forward. And I think if, if you were to choose one of these two walking motions as being human-like, you'd probably choose the one over here. We certainly found it to be more efficient. If you had a small foot, you were more efficient shifting it forward. We also looked at the same radius foot. Here it is again, centered on the lower leg, and here it is shifted forward. Well, you pay a huge price because you don't want to stub your toe. And so you have to bend your knee excessively if you have it shifted forward. And so in, in that case, these are the bad cases. Right? If, you've got a, if you've got a long radius foot, you don't want it shifted forward because you get too much bending of the knee in the swing. If you have a small radius foot, you don't want it neutral because you don't get as much rolling motion. When we switch, these are the two advantageous circumstances. You either have a small radius foot that you shift forward or a large radius foot that you have centered. And what we found is the energetic efficiency of both of these two is about the same. This work is important because when you think about humans who don't have ankle joints, right? We're not talking about running with our robots yet, but this is an example. Here's a, a dual amputee here in the Paralympics. Here's a unilateral amputee, so he has the, the amputation on only one side. These devices are attached, so here's the, the, the leg spring that he uses for his foot and lower, lower leg that provides the ankle. These are not powered prostheses, they're all passive. There's a socket that fits over the residual limb. Well, how and where you attach this prosthesis to the socket is similar to how we attach the feet to our robot. You can shift the location front to back, you can shift it inside and out. And so one of the things we're trying to do is translate our robot research into how do we do a better job of aligning these prostheses for these individuals. And certainly you might align a prosthesis very differently for an 18-year-old soldier who comes back from combat with an amputation than you would for, say, a 70-year-old diabetic who had an amputation otherwise, for a medical reason. The one is going to wear the device for 60 years, you hope, right? And, the other, and that one, you want to be pushing him or her to expend as much energy as possible in some ways because you want their cardiovascular fitness to the 70-year-old diabetic may have other medical issues, and if you push him or her to expend more energy, that could cause other medical problems. And so we try to understand the effects of the design of the, the curvature of the foot, as well as its placement, and translate that into designing and aligning prostheses better for amputees. Okay, killer problem in mobile robots is, is energy. It's power consumption. But that's not the only problem. Right? So again, here's the Atlas robot that was part of the, the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which was a, a big effort about a year and a half ago, um, where the, 
Department of Defense gave robots like this to a number of, of uh, researchers, and then other researchers built their own, and they got together and they, they competed to see, in one hour's time, who could provide a disaster relief uh, scenario, uh, a robot rescue type scenario, similar to the, the nuclear disaster <laughs> in Japan. Right? And you want to send a, you've got a disaster environment, so you've got uneven terrain, but it's in a human designed nuclear facility, so you have stairs, and you don't want to send humans in because it's contaminated. Well, this is uh, one of the, I think the second place robot uh, from the from a school in, in Florida. Again, walking over simulated disaster road. And this is it a few moments later. And the scenario did not particularly end well. Now they had multiple trials, right? And so uh, you can't just think about energy because stability is the other problem, right? We can't have these things falling apart. And in, in full disclosure, we have this problem too, right? <laughs> so this is Ernie with the curved feet, right? Trying to have uh, uh, good efficiency. And we put a barrier in the lab, unexpected to the robot, and it's gonna bump into that barrier and doesn't quite make it, right? And part of this is a result of the control strategy we use, right? It's not a function of time, but it is a function of that falling motion. And if the speed unexpectedly changes for the robot, we don't have a mechanism, we didn't have a mechanism to adapt to that. So stability is the second problem, right? In engineering terms, we call that robustness. You might think about it as resistance to falling, which is certainly very important when we translate that work into to human walking. But energy and stability. And here we're, we're talking about the stability issue. So for our robot, you can hear it pounding its leg. And, we take inspiration from what humans do when they slow down to the next step. Okay, you should hear the feet touching down at the same time, so it's a fair comparison. Contacts at the same time. Look at the torso and the swing leg here. If someone holds you back from, wanting, from you wanting to walk forward, you essentially lean in. Provide ankle-like motion. So 
instead of pushing off with your ankle, if you torque the flywheel at exactly the right time, it has a similar effect of pushing off. And so we did it, right? We, we run, this is pretty typical of our research, we run simulations to see if it's, if it's feasible, and then we build it to see if it's really feasible because we don't really trust our simulations, right? <laughs> Um, here's the flywheel on, mounted on the hip axis of, of Ernie. You can see the windings of the electrical motor that, that actuated here. And it works. We're, we're back to point feet here. 24 meters per second is a very slow gait. You see a little bit of rotation. We increase the speed. You see more rotation of the flywheel. We get up to one meter per second and it's, it's really moving. And this is about a comfortable speed. And so what we saw is, if we actually spin this wheel every step, we use less energy than if we were carrying it as dead weight, which makes a lot of sense. Now, we don't use less energy than if we didn't have any weight at all, but there is the added benefit that if someone comes and pushes from behind, you don't have to flop your torso around so much, you can spin the flywheel. And if, as long as you're gonna carry the extra weight around, you might as well use it on every stride to save a little bit of energy. Okay, so energy and stability are key problems that we address in our robotics research. They're also the key problems that human beings need to overcome when they do rehabilitation of their locomotion capabilities. Let's talk about energy uh, for starters. So I do have, I have a project in collaboration with some folks in physical therapy at Ohio State um, for spinal cord injury. They have a a center there that, that deals with a lot of individuals who've had spinal cord injuries. Uh, this gentleman's name is Aaron. Um, he's uh, the victim of multiple gunshot wounds in an attempted robbery. Uh, he was robbed, to be clear. And as uh, is a subject in our study, um, moves around in, in a wheelchair, uh, very active a gentleman, plays wheelchair basketball all over the country, um, but also has the ability to, to walk with Walking, walking aids, and is actively involved still many years out from his injury in therapy. And this is a setup uh, for a standard approach to sp a spinal cord therapy that's called uh, locomotor training. And so what happens is the, the individual is placed in a, in a harness, and you can see it's, uh, there's a belt around his pelvis here, attached to a chain here that is pulled on with a force that's regulated to support a, a certain percentage of his body weight. So we refer to this as body weight supported treadmill training. <coughs> I've actually been in this, this system. If you have a chance to be in a body weight suit and try to walk on a treadmill, it's, it's a remarkable experience. It's, it's crazy how it changes the way it feels to walk. They pulled up on me as much as 70% of my body weight. And at very slow speeds, you feel like you're running because they're so light uh, effectively. There are three therapists that work with him. In this case, we're, we're working on rehabilitation of his hips, how he uses his hips side to side to control his walking. This therapist, you see, has a towel wrapped around his torso, is trying to help control that torso, keep it upright so that he can concentrate on his hip motion. These two gentlemen that you'll see in the, the next image, one uh, has hands on each of his legs, essentially trying to help him execute his walking motion so that his toe doesn't drag. If you, in your walking, drag your toe, it sends a very specific signal to your spinal cord that you're tripping. And that's exactly what we don't want to happen for these subjects. We want them to feel the comfortable, rhythmic motion of walking. Making the human structure. So I'm very excited to have this active collaboration with team at Ohio State. There are actually two projects at Ohio State with the, the spinal cord population. And one is primarily focused on rehabilitating their use of their hips, how we use our hips to absorb energy with each step. And that's an area in which these folks have some persistent deficits even after long therapy. The second part of the project is to look at rehabilitating use of the knee for the same purposes. Individuals with spinal cord injury often have difficulty with that initial flexion of the knee early on when their foot hits the ground. And that means they expend more energy in walking and can't walk as fast. 
The idea of the downhill treadmill is to give them practical experience to focus on absorbing energy at the knee, letting that knee flex a little bit when the foot touches down. We don't want these folks to just get better on the treadmill. Uh, all of our metrics of success are measured in overground walking that they would do in the community, in their home, with their families, looking to improve their quality of life. A huge advantage that, that Jim has, he can control the magnitude of the change, um, so he can make tiny changes and see what the impact of that is. He can do it quick, and sometimes even tiny changes will make the robot fall, and we will never do that in patients or, or participants, human subjects that are participating in our research. We're just, we're not, we're not able to let that level of failure happen. With the flat training, I got a lot back, but as I've gotten back on this to decline, it uh, seems to have gotten my hips in better control a lot faster. And it, the differences started occurring relatively early within the training. I'd say after six, eight sessions, I'm really noticing differences. And I'm not gonna lie to anybody, walking is lightweight painful for me. It's a double-edged sword. I gotta do it, because I don't wanna sit still. And I feel a lot better when I, after I do it. So when I see them be able to move their legs independently um, on the treadmill in new ways and in ways that are more normal, it is, it gives me chills. And some of the people that we've had in this experiment, and we've only done a few cases so far, have demonstrated things to me I've never seen in my whole career as a physical therapist. These are people who have overcome tremendous hardship with their spinal cord injury and are incredibly positive about their recovery and willing to, to try and to work hard um, and to help us learn. And, and we think it's benefiting them, and they're certain that even if it doesn't benefit them, it will benefit someone else. And so that's been absolutely inspirational for me. Just thankful to be a part of everything, and uh, anything I can do to get to the cure of this problem, I'm willing to help. Uh, I'm just glad you guys believe in me, because if you guys didn't believe in me, who would? So he just finished up 12 weeks of training three days a week at Ohio State um, on the downhill treadmill. And what we're, what we're working on here, we alluded to briefly in the video, when you and I walk, one of the things you do is you absorb energy with each, each step. So your knee will flex early on in the step. And if you think about um, your muscles, your muscles only generate force when they're, when they're contracting, right? If you're familiar with weightlifting and you do negatives, it's where you've got a, a heavy load in your, say, in your arms, and the, the muscle's trying to contract, but it's actually extending as you go in the opposite direction. And that's, uh, that's called doing negative work with your muscles. So when, they're, when the muscle's extending, but it's applying a force, it does negative work. This is something that's very hard for spinal cord patients. And that's exactly what you do when you step down and you let your knee bend. Because if you don't provide force across that knee, you'll collapse and fall but your muscles only contract, right? They don't, they don't provide force and extension. So it's, it's negative work, you're absorbing energy. And you can imagine if you're a spinal cord patient, right? If you're nervous that you can't do that, you basically have two strategies, and this is what we see. You either fire your muscles like crazy, right? So your leg is really rigid and you can slam it in the ground, kind of like you heard our robot doing, right? Or you say, all right, I'm gonna walk like these robots, really, really bend knee. Right? So that I touch down much, much softer than, than I normally would, which doesn't allow you to exchange energy the way people do. And so the idea here is to train people with incomplete spinal cord injuries. It's not for complete cutting of the cord, but a, a, an injury that's a partial cut of the cord. To try to get them back to being able to do that absorption of energy, that negative work with their muscles. And so 
One thing you can do is you can tilt the treadmill down. And that's, that's what we've done. Um, you can see it a little bit in, in this diagram, or in this picture. It's slanted downward. Because when you walk downhill, you have to absorb energy. It, you're forced to. And so the idea of this study is to use that slope of the treadmill to help activate that type of muscle activation for them so they retrain. You do this, this negative work at both the knees and the hips. And this particular, Aaron is working in the, the hip study. Um, and he made, made real progress. We had some of these individuals who transferred from a walker to a cane, which may not sound like a big quality of life difference, but the speed that they can walk at with a cane is so much faster than, than it is with a walker. Um, we're early on in this project. We're, we're hoping our, our initial results are very promising. We're hoping to run more subjects and continue it, expand it to a, a larger base. But um, it's a neat way where the types of analysis we do with the robots is equally applicable when we analyze human beings. And, and I talk mainly about energy, right? Energy and stability are our two problems. I mainly talk about energy. You can't throw out stability for these folks, right? Uh, just as my, my colleague, Dr. Basso, said, we can't let them fall. Uh, I love that quote, though. She was basically saying how lucky I was that my robots could fall, right? And, and off camera, at the same time, I'm like, wait a minute, Michelle, but, but who has the better control system? Are, are your spinal cord patients or my robots more effectively controlled. She's like, oh, the spinal cord patients are, are way ahead of you guys. And that's absolutely true. Even with the spinal cord injury, the, the human brain control capability is so much greater than what we can do with our robots now. And so she has advantages, I have advantages. Um, we work together to, to try to help these folks improve. Energy and stability are our problems. Let's talk about stability now. Um, specifically, in this case, let's talk about individuals who've had a stroke. And probably everyone in this room knows someone this is a, who's had a stroke. This is a very prevalent uh, injury, uh, far more prevalent than, than spinal cord. And balance deficits are very common. Almost 80% of people who've had a stroke have some kind of balance deficit. And so they do therapy in systems like these. You'll see, right, there's a harness in both cases. These are commercial off-the-shelf systems to prevent the, the, the individual from falling because they have stability issues. There's a platform they stand on that allows you to, to perturb their, their standing posture to get a sense of how, how abil their ability to reject disturbances, just like our robots need to reject disturbances. Uh, there's a visual field, right, that can be altered because your balance is a combination of vision, right, your inner ear, your equilibrium of, of your inner ear sensing, and your proprioception, which is your, your feeling underneath your feet. And if you've ever been on the highway and you've seen a truck drive by and you felt like you were going backwards instead of forwards, that's the effect of vision on your balance. Um, if you've ever played Ring Around the Rosie, like my kids do, right, and you fall over because you got dizzy, that's the effect of the equilibrium. And then if you've ever stood on, on foam or else uh, had the unpleasant feeling of your foot falling asleep, if you lose sensation on the bottoms of your feet, that also affects your balance. These systems are great, right? They can tease out effect of equilibrium, proprioception, vision. But they also cost on the order of $100,000. Now, we have some of these available in South Bend at, at, at research clinics. Uh, at, at actually, at, not at research clinics, at non-research clinics in practice. Um, but it takes time to, to get someone in this. So we think about balance in basically the same way we think about stability for walking. Your mass. You know, your center mass is again about your waist. Now, in, in this case, we're talking about, I'm thinking about shifting weight back and forth. But it's still an inverted pendulum, right? It's still affecting, uh, how do you keep this upright? Because it, you're naturally unstable, right? If, if your mass is up here, it wants to fall down. And this is a, a fantastic testament to the, the human control system. Right, is that you are inherently unstable when you are in upright posture. Because the, 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 the safest place to be is on the ground where your potential energy is dropped. And so this is what the force under your feet looks like, even if you're just standing still. You naturally kind of wander around. The effective vertical force on your feet, we call it the center of pressure, it wanders around. And these systems measure where that is, and they give you visual feedback based on it. Well, they're not the only thing that can do that, though, right? Probably 
many of you, at least the younger folks in the audience, have played Nintendo Wii, which does exactly the same thing for about $100. Right? It measures where the center of pressure is under the feet, and it allows you to do balance-related games, like skiing, where you have to shift your weight back and forth. Uh, you may be more familiar with yoga, where it, this is great. It actually shows you where your center of mass, roughly they approximate it, where it is and where it should be for that yoga pose, so that you're balanced. And it scores you, right? It gives you a, a wee fit age. But if you're a physical therapist and you're working with someone who has balance deficits after a stroke, chances are they're not capable of playing the skiing game. They simply don't have the skills. They might be okay with the yoga, but you can't have them repeat the same task over and over again. It's the game controls the progression. It's not what the therapist does. And this is not a very fine resolution measure of their performance in the, in the exercise. So what I did was uh, very fortunate to work with a great team here. Um, yeah, there's me. This is Chuck Crawl. He's a, a psychologist here at, at Notre Dame in the psychology department, as is Mike Milano. This is Aaron Striegel. He's the computer scientist on the team. And then everyone else you see here is a physical therapist from Memorial Hospital in downtown South Bend. Fantastic, amazing physical therapist who really taught us everything we know. I mean, I'm, I'm an engineer. I, I, I've done physical therapy, but I'm not, a, I'm not someone who I've had physical therapy myself. I'm not someone who, who gives physical therapy. And the idea was basically, okay, with, with the help of our computer scientist, uh, Aaron Striegel, we'll just hack the Bluetooth interface of, of the Weeboard and write our own code, right? So we have a subject standing on the balance board. There's no wired connection to our, our laptop where we wrote our own software. It's just a Bluetooth connection. That connects to a large display that's got speakers for audio. And we essentially do we have. What we have where it's <laughs> software that the therapist gets to control. Where we can actually measure, because we get the data, we can measure how well someone does compared to how they did previously. And so this is, uh, this is Amy Gaynor, again, one of our all-star therapists at Memorial Hospital working with, with a patient and, and a caregiver. You can see he's standing on, on the board, uh, watching the large screen. She's got the Wiimote in her hand. Uh, she can't be over at the computer typing when he's there because there's risk of him falling. She needs to be next to him. Well, the Wiimote is perfect for that, right? We just hack the Bluetooth interface for that too, and it controls the software. There you go, good job. 62-year-old Lance Grove, Mishawaka, is going home from Memorial Hospital tomorrow after suffering a stroke. Part of his inpatient therapy involves the popular game system Wii. Using a PC and Wii balance board, he came up with what they call WeHab. It provides visual feedback. The therapist can say, OK, I want you to do this task. And they're not just telling them, I want you to do this. They're showing them, OK, on the screen, I want you to move your center of gravity, represented by this green circle, to the target, represented by this blue circle. Michael and his Notre Dame professors worked alongside the hospital's therapist to make sure they were on the right track. What's evolved, then, is a system that provides visual feedback to a patient doing balance retraining in rehab based on where their center of gravity is when they're standing on this board. A system therapist Amy Gaynor says works and makes therapy more fun. Well, it's nice coming up here, we're totally in the blue area. So what does that show you, Amy? That shows me if where he's bearing, if he's bearing weight on both feet equally or if he's pushing off with one leg harder than the other or he loses his balance to one side. Lance won't be taking the WeHab home with him, but Notre Dame researchers are hoping that might be the case in the not-so-distant future, making it a relatively inexpensive, helpful, and fun form of therapy. <coughs> Done? Okay. I'll step off. So there's a couple of different ways you can provide visual feedback. One is percentage of weight on left and right feet. So the bars go up or down if we increase the amount of weight you put on your left foot, this bar rises. The blues are the targets, so we want them, in this case, we want someone to stay balanced. We've actually found it's, it's better, that people perform better, if you provide a two-dimensional view, which you saw in the video where this dot, in terms of where their center of pressure is, moves around. They simply they either intuit it better, or they, they do a better job of tasks. Um, and so we've been primarily working with this type of feedback. 
More recently, uh, my student Kevin will do a demo here very momentarily for anyone who wants to come up and stand on the Wii board. Um, he's been looking at how, do you, how can you get better performance out of these subjects by manipulating the feedback. So making someone think they're doing worse than they actually are uh, to push them to go to try harder than they, they, they were otherwise. And there's some really neat things we can do there. Um, because you have a limited amount of time for therapy, right? I mean, these people get at most 30 minutes of balance therapy a day, five days a week. And so if anything you can do to maximize how effectively that time is used for the therapist. We're not replacing therapists, we're giving therapists additional tools to use. Um, and we think that feedback manipulation is one that could be, could be very handy. If you want to do this at home, go to wehab, that's wehab.nd.edu. You can download our software for free. Okay? All you need is a PC, a Wemo, and a balance board. And the instructions are there. If you have problems, you can email me, but you, you, you can get the software, you can download it. Um, my parents have it at their house, <laughs> to be honest. So um, we are going to get the Wii board set up with Kevin. Um, I talked today about energy and stability, which are the core problems that we look at for the walking robots in my lab. They're also the core problems that people like Aaron uh, try to overcome when they're trying to rehab after spinal cord injury. And then the same kind of problems that individuals deal with when they have balance deficits after stroke. And the same principles that we see in the robot apply across them. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions, but we are going to get the Wii set up so that people can do some balance training right here if they're interested. Thanks you, again for coming. If you have any questions, raise your hand. All right, well then we'll encourage everybody to come up here and interact with the robots, but first, I, on behalf of the Alumni Association, want to say thank you to Jim and his students here, and. Please accept this Notre Dame wine on behalf of the Alumni Association. <laughs>